Please welcome to the virtual stage, Distinguished Architect at Synopsys, Dr. Ming Zhang. Transistor scaling are slowing down. That's what the social media headlines is today. What if the next wave of the 1000X innovation is right at our fingertips? Hi, my name is Ming Zhang from Synopsys. I'm really honored to be here at, at ERI to speak about the future of 3D IC. Together, let's embark on a journey to observe the industry trends beyond two-dimensional microelectronics. Let's think about why now is the right time and what are the challenges we face as we build 3D IC and what's the journey ahead. In this industry, there are three notable families of players. The people who create chips and systems, the people who manufacture chips, and then there's us, Synopsys. We are the EDA company that empower and enable the process of chip creation. System makers are making more and more chips in 3D. Here's a wonderful product that was just released by Tesla. It's chips in 3D that's making a new history for AI and autonomous driving. Why do companies want to build 3D chips? Well, they're typically one of the two reasons. One reason is to collect chiplets coming from optimal processes so that when they're combined together, you get the best functionality at the system level. That's the system of chiplets or integration. The other reason is to break down a larger chip into smaller pieces so you accomplish higher yield. That gets you lower cost. So greater performance, power, and lower cost. In some cases, Either, either integration or disaggregation will give you a faster time to market as compared to a monolithic chip. And if it's done correctly, you can actually get better security. Commonly, in the commercial world, networking SOCs and co-packaged optics are great examples of integrated electronics, such as uh, a, when you have to combine a piece of optical chip that's in a special process with a digital SOC. And Larger chips, such as high-performance computer AI, works better with disaggregated design styles. In aerospace and defense, there are some unique challenges. Many products are lower volume, higher mix, and many of the products need to live in the field for a longer time. And many of them are experiencing harsh conditions, whether it's sea or land, or even worse, space, radiation resistance. A lot of special constraints have to be put in order in order to design and manufacture these chips correctly. What about manufacturing? Integrated circuit, or IC, has always been leading packaging. Packaging has always followed IC. With what's happening now, advanced packaging, advanced packaging and IC are now a continuum. They're offering chip creators a full portfolio of technology solutions so that the chip creators can balance performance and energy and various options of substrate types. There are many, many manufacturers that support advanced packaging, whether it's 2.5 or 3D. Very few of them are domestic. What about EDA? EDA stands for Electronic Design Automation. As a Synopsys employee, I'm really proud to say that we at Synopsys enable the journey of creation for the creators of chips. As a creator, you would like to create your chips going through three steps. Explore, design, and manufacture. In the first step, you want to explore very carefully, very thoroughly, but quickly. You want to pick your best choices of your substrate and chiplets. You want to be able to analyze the performance and cost early. And then you go to step two, to go from a, nap a drawing on a napkin to a fully optimized design that's ready to be produced. And then finally, as you manufacture, you're going to want to make a lot of chips quickly at lower cost in a safely manner and a reliable manner. In a perfect world, a total solution to enable the creation of a 3D chip would have three pillars. One, interface IP that connects all the dies or chiplets together. Two, a design platform that helps designer to go from A to Z. And three, manufacturing and deployment. And it's very important, in particular for AND, that we need to have secure by design and correct by construction to ensure 
the products live longer in the field. Interface IP are the magic connecting the dyes together, regardless whether the underlying substrates are 2D, 2.5D, or 3D. A menu of interface IP would provide a balanced trade-off among performance, power, and various industry standards. A design platform enables the creation journey from early on, architecture planning, exploration, to the middle phase, which is implementation, and to the final phase, which is thorough analysis and verification and getting ready to turning this into a manufactured chip. When the chips are being made and being tested, we want to ensure all the problems are being tested and debugged. So it's very important to have the right features of DFT and DFD. But more importantly, with the complexity of 3D IC, it's even more important to have the ability to monitor the chip during and after deployment, such that they continue to operate reliably. That'll require some sort of circuit level sensors and some mechanism of collecting and analyzed data. Okay, why is it that now is the right time to be looking at the opportunity to go beyond 2D microelectronics? Let me talk about three reasons, technology reasons, application reasons, and society reasons. Technologically speaking, we have had a wonderful time in the last 50 years to enjoy the benefit of two-dimensional scaling, logic or memory. Look at the beautiful curves. Going forward, three-dimensional dense interconnects will be the catalyst beyond miniaturization barrier. In terms of application, they're going to continue to push the limit, regardless whether the technology is ready. As one example, in this particular data point, AI training is really pushing the limit. The amount of memory has only about doubled every year, but the size of the model has been increasing by more than 200x every year in the past four to five years. So technology must overcome memory barrier. That's why we need to work harder to create the right technology so that we can continue to enjoy a greater amount of benefit from innovative applications such as AI. The world of electronics used to be simple. It's always computers, TV sets, telephones. Now we're looking at Internet of Things, autonomous driving vehicles and drones and who knows what's coming. But we have a problem. There's an ongoing chip shortage. And according to at least one data point, the number of hardware engineers is only 10% of that of software engineers. I couldn't find the data for the number of circuit designers or chip designers. I'm pretty sure it's much less than 10%. Do we have sufficient velocity of innovation that matches the velocity of demand? I think the society needs more chip innovation done faster and being made more accessible to more people. And now is the time. In fact, now more than ever, because that we have such a great portfolio of technology that's avail already available today, such as heterogeneous integration of chiplets through dense interconnects as shown by the Intel product release this year, or super monolithic integration of very innovative, very emerging devices, such as nanosheet and nanotubes being put together monolithically as opposed to heterogeneously. And what about even better, a hybrid architecture that combines heterogeneous technology, monolithic technology, and architectural techniques, then you can get the benefit of multiplying all the advantages together. Technology are going to give us wings, in fact, now more than ever. Life is easy, right? No. It's actually going to be really challenging. Let's look at the three pillars of chip creation. Design, verification, and security. It has been easy. It's going to get harder with 3D IC. Process variation has always been a challenge for 2D microelectronics. So was reliability in field. With three-dimensional ICs, process variation, reliability, imperfection will become even more relevant. For example, nanotubes are not going to be perfect. So it's very important as we design, we are able to tolerate such variations or at least adapt to it. When we write software code, we would be able to see the result early so that we can either fail or succeed fast. I'd love to have the same for a complex 3D IC system. And that's the value of end-to-end -end system exploration 
and a co-optimization. It's very important to recognize that with 3DIC, technology at the bottom, architecture, circuits in the middle, and algorithms and software on the top are all mingle together. It'll be good to be able to explore, play around, and optimize them together end to end. Many of the 3D IC circuits where the resulting chips or modules will go into very complex products that live for a very long time. So it's very important to be able to monitor their behavior in the field after deployment. That depends on having the right level of circuit sensors and the right level of data connection analytics. And these things are really challenging for 3D IC, but that's exactly where the opportunities are. Verification has always been a really big challenge. In fact, there's a thing called verification gap, which essentially says the problem of verification is bigger than design. Now, with 3D IC, there's going to be more or newer domain-specific accelerators, such as AIs. And as you put together different chips, there's going to be a lot more interconnect, a lot more partitions. And some of the building blocks are either very difficult to model, or there's no model for it, hence black boxes. And for heterogeneous integration systems, multiple process technology, crossing analog or digital domains, inevitable. All these things contribute to an even worse verification gap for 3D IC. Security. If you look at the 3D chip on the left, the fact that you have an interposer and a bunch of die to die connectivity that are more exposed than metal on a monolithic chip create a greater amount of attack opportunity when you compare that with a simpler monolithic chip. And when you have one chiplet that is common to many systems, if that one chip was compromised somehow, it'll have a bigger negative impact. 3 dic will have a longer and more complex supply chain, which means on an incremental scale when compared to 2D, it's statistically more likely to have bad things happen, such as Trojans and counterfeits. So we've got to work harder on the security challenges. What is the journey ahead? I always thought it's good to have a perspective on the past before I look into the future. I started my career as a circuit designer when, fortunately, rectangles still represent mostly transistors and metal lines. That's the 2D microelectronics. Then I had my own startup. We had the automated chiplet integration on active silicon opposer. Now I'm at Synopsys working on 3D. So basically, I spent the last 20 years adding one dimensional to my professional career as a chip designer. Let's look at the decades ahead. I'm really excited about the next 1000X of transistors per chip. Regardless whether that benefit is coming from traditional scaling of transistors and wires, or monolithic integration, or heterogeneous integrations, or hybrid architecture that combines all of the above, or the next 1000X of better energy, higher performance, hence greater products. And the thing that I'm most excited about is the possibility of 1000X of the number of people who can actually create and innovate on chip design. Perhaps, just perhaps, 3DIC can actually make the impossible technology possible. Perhaps, the photonics that's powering the lightsabers. Perhaps, the artificial intelligence embedded in the brain of R2D2, if he has a brain. Or perhaps, whatever the black magic is, driving the three-dimensional hologram. The thing that excites me the most is to see you next year in 3D. Presenting on Revolutionary Photonic Microsystems, DARPA MTO Program Manager Dr. Gordon Keeler and Dr. John Bowers, Distinguished Professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Hi, I'm Gordon Keeler, a Program Manager in MTO. Today I'm going to talk to you about optical microsystems, and in particular about the integrated photonics that underlie these systems. So, we all know the promise of photonic integration, right? The idea is we have these exquisite optical systems made with bulk components. They might be the size of a tabletop, and we want to shrink them down to the size of a sugar cube or maybe a postage stamp. Photonic integration, therefore, offers this huge benefit in terms of size, weight, and power. 
But there's another benefit, just as important, when we use semiconductor manufacturing to make these photonic integrated circuits. It allows us a path to high volume manufacturing and low cost, allows us to deploy these systems all over the place. But if you get just one thing out of my talk today, it should be this. It's that there's something new. It's that the components that we're making suddenly have gotten very, very good. The systems, optical microsystems, and the integrated photonic components are now beginning to exceed the performance of these traditional bulk systems. And that's going to enable a whole lot in the future. All right. So we talk a lot about digital compute in ERI. We know that optics is good for moving digital bits around, right? It drives the internet. It drives data centers and high-performance computing. Uh, under the PIPES program and other investments, we're looking at driving photonics deeper into our systems and also using it for other things like disaggregated architectures or perhaps doing photonic accelerators. Outside of ERI, but really adjacent, there's a couple other areas that you really need to pay attention to. Shown in yellow, optical front end. This really refers to the, uh, the use of photonics as the interface between our electronic systems and the, the physical world, right? For, for imaging, for displays, for free space communications, or, or LIDAR. And shown in blue here, microsensors. Um, here we might be making small systems where photonics don't uh, leave or enter the boundary, but it's essential for doing precision PNT or sensing electrical or magnetic fields or chem bio agents. So both of these applications are, are really important because the total addressable market here is huge. If you think about putting photonic solutions in autonomous vehicles or in cell phones or in wearables, we're talking sort of hundreds of millions of units important for both the DOD and commercial space. And so when some of these take off, it's going to totally change the photonics landscape. OK, back to ERI is emerging compute. And photonics technologies are really essential for doing some of the things that we're interested in here, um, like non von Neumann computing, analog signal processing, and quantum information processing. All right, so how do we enable those applications? It's with the toolbox or the components that are in our integrated photonics. I don't have time to talk about all the advances. That's what the next speaker is going to do. But I will point out that a lot of them are using domestic foundries, so it's not a big step to go from demonstration of a component to real-world impact. All right, so first talking about complexity. Under Moab, we're demonstrating LiDAR chips with tens of thousands of photonic components per chip. This is a reticle scale photonic chip. Under Pipes, this is a photonic chiplet that includes 50 million transistors monolithically integrated with the components. Dodo's program is looking at quiet lasers. Here, we've made huge strides in terms of precision and accuracy. You'll hear more from uh, the next speaker about the many orders of magnitude improvement that we're seeing in performance here. Under Lumos, we're doing many different things. One important area is nonlinear photonics, bringing new materials in high confinement, allowing us to make microcombs on a chip and doing second harmonic and other frequency generation, and also integrating gain onto silicon wafers. Here, we're looking at quantum dot lasers that are getting uh, record lifetimes. We're looking to make optical gain in silicon photonics available to the community through multi-project wafers offered next year. So finally, let me talk about how this technology is going to get out to uh, impact the real world. Professor John Bowers, our next speaker, has been working with DARPA for a long time. Uh, some of the technologies he's worked on like the hybrid silicon laser, have gone from university demonstration under DARPA funding about 15 years ago. And he's worked to transition them to places like Intel and Orion, where they now form the basis of the silicon photonics transceiver market. We're talking millions of units shipped per year. So John today is going to talk about how the component research he's doing today on Dodos, Pipes, and other programs is going to enable this future of new applications tomorrow. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor John Bowers. Thank you for that introduction. I'd like to talk today about advances in silicon photonic integrated circuits and how they're affecting a number of different application areas. The initial applications have been in information technology, uh, principally telecommunications, 
where companies like Acacia have been making coherent transmitter and receiver chips and now dominate in long-distance communications. Similarly, in data centers, Intel and Cisco have been developing 100 gigabit and 400 gigabit uh, chips for transceivers, for interconnecting uh, servers in, in data centers. And most recently now, optical computation, where optical neural networks, where silicon photonics is being used to uh, uh, do neural networks, and, and we'll see them, I think, deployed for GPUs in the future. Similarly, in optical metrology, optical clocks, navigation, spectroscopy, uh, are utilizing silicon photonic integrated circuits to get smaller size and better performance. And you'll hear some of that in terms of navigation in particular. And then finally, sensing, LIDARs, gyroscopes, imaging, and uh, again, the integration of a large number of, of photonic elements makes for very efficient 2D scanning of, of LIDARs in, in particular. This is the evolution of electronic chips uh, in data centers, and that's been going on for a long time, and it existed for a long time with electronic chips surrounded by pluggable photonics around the edge of the circuit board. And that has now transformed over to co-packaging, where electronics and photonics are in the same package, and that saves a large amount of power, because no longer do you have to drive these long copper lines from the chip to the edge of the circuit board, and you don't need to do the retiming and reclock generation and, uh, that's necessary in those cases. And so you save lots and lots of power, typically half the power of the ship was used to drive I.O. But now putting photonics in the package, the core focus of the PIPES program that Gordon uh, discussed is uh, being implemented. So that's at, at 25 terabits and the next generation at 50 terabits. And then as you go forward, uh, we'll see even tighter integration, not just 2.5D, but 3D, where the electronic chip and the photonic chip are, are mounted on each other, and that allows very short interconnection lengths, uh, much shorter than this you know, millimeter lengths here, but now we're talking about microns. And consequently, we have very low capacitance drives, and that allows you to have very low power. So instead of uh, tens of picojoules per bit, we're now at you know, sub-picojoule per bit. And then that extends on beyond as we get to integrated lasers with these uh, co-packaged chips, such that in just five years, uh, we should be seeing chips with 204 terabits per second of, of I.O. on these chips, which is an amazing number. This is an example for routing chips, but in general, I think all high-capacity electronics, whether they're processors, memory chips, switches, GPUs, will use 3D integrated photonics. This article down here by Broadcom, Intel, and ourselves summarizes this progression that we see happening over the next decade. To achieve this very high capacity interconnects, there's been a lot of photonic integration that has gone on for the last uh, 20 years. And Infinera has led the effort on indium phosphide-based photonic integrated circuits, and they've had a big impact on the telecommunications applications. More recently now, silicon has become an important photonic element. It was delayed by you know, roughly 10 years, and that's because silicon is an indirect band gap. And so it's a very inefficient emitter of light, and it wasn't used initially for photonic integrated circuits. However, once it, people realize that silicon is actually an excellent uh, waveguide material, much lower loss than gallium arsenide or indium phosphide, and you can make excellent modulators and detectors on it, and uh, so now the largest chips are, are made with unsilicon photonics, LiDAR chips or big switching chips. And uh, if you look at integrating lasers with that, with that electronic chip, then you see there's a very similar progression. It's been delayed by a couple of years due to the need to, to integrate the laser onto that chip. But again, what you see here is all the electronic companies are, are now making big photonic integrated circuits, either without lasers or with lasers in the case of Intel and Juniper. So how do you integrate the laser? There's two main approaches that are being used today. One is to bond 3.5 materials, and 3.5 materials are very efficient emitters, you know, close to 100% internal efficiency. And then you remove the substrate and do all the processing afterwards uh, using the same 300 millimeter CMOS facility. And these are primarily based on quantum well devices, either aluminum gallium medium arsenide or indium gallium arsenide phosphide for 1.3 or 1.5 micron applications. And then other materials for either visible applications, in that case you would use, uh, say, gallium nitride uh, with silicon nitride waveguides, but similar process. And again, that's the focus of the LUMOS program that Gordon discussed. 
uh, or you know, intraband cascade or quantum cascade lasers to, to integrate again on silicon or perhaps silicon germanium waveguides at longer wavelengths and extend this out from 2 to literally 12 microns. This is a picture of what one of those chips looks like and uh, wafers looks like. And so there's an, a, a, lots of different 100 gigabit transceivers on this chip. The next thing is to look at epitaxial growth on silicon. And that hasn't been done because there's a large lattice mismatch between the 3.5 material and silicon. And that causes dislocations and other defects, antiphase defects, because you're growing a, a polar material on top of a, a nonpolar material. And so that isn't in commercial production yet, but there's a lot of progress being made. And this is a, one of the focus of the LUMOS program. In particular, if you grow quantum dots, it turns out that quantum dots are, are literally about 100,000 time, 100, times more reliable or more insensitive to defect propagation, dark line defect growth and stuff, than quantum wells are. And uh, so we grow them with a process called stransky krasunov growth. So it's indium arsenide grown on gallium arsenide, highly mismatched such that the material grows in little bubbles on the surface. It doesn't smooth out in a, in a plane. And then we cap those, and, and you can make very efficient emitters. They're much like quantum boxes, and so uh, you get very efficient uh, use of, of the semiconductor material. Uh, we typically use MBE to grow these. Uh, they're also using MOCVD. And what's exciting is there's been a recent breakthrough uh, in this where we can now get 100 million hour lifetime at high temperatures uh, in, in the system. So we've been working primarily with, with IQE and AIM and Quintessent to uh, transfer this technology, but it looks very exciting. So we use these quantum dot materials uh, in a pipes program. So again, we're trying to get very high capacity links. The first effort focus has been uh, one terabit per second link, but now the efficiency is actually you know, 10 or 20 times better than commercial systems at 0.5 picojoule per bit energy efficiency. And to achieve the high capacity of a terabit using electronics that are running at, at say 25 gigahertz, uh, we use wavelength division multiplexing to get you know, 20 times that base rate. We use polarization division multiplexing to double the rate. And then we use space division multiplexing. And that's particularly important to get to the really high capacity systems, the 100 terabit systems that are going to be needed in, you know, in, in the next decade. Again, we use 3D bonding of EICs to PICs to get very low capacitance. If you don't do that, you can't get these uh, low energy uh, drives. So this is reported recently at OFC, but the structure is shown here. This is the quantum dot modlock comb source, generates the 20 wavelengths. And then we uh, de-interleave these and then modulate each of them with a ring modulator. And I'll show those in the next slide, but they're very efficient, just 8 femtojoule uh, per bit. And then we multiplex them back up again and then have multiple versions of these to get to, to 10 terabits per second. On the receiving side, you again, polarization demux, you de-interleave, and again, you have a series of rings of different diameters, so they resonate at different wavelengths, and then photodetectors to, to take the signal off each of them. This is the uh, picture of the, just a separately packaged modelac laser, uh, quantum dot, and again, we use quantum dots for two reasons. One is that they're reflection insensitive, about 40 dB less reflection sensitive than quantum wells, and that's because the line width enhancement factor is effectively zero. The second reason is that quantum dots have about 10 times higher four-way mixing coefficient, and what that means is all these different lines uh, phase a lock together very efficiently and very, with very, very low noise. And uh, so we can get, in this case, you can see 20 wavelengths across here at approximately the same energy, uh, and very low power being emitted outside those 20 lines. We can hit, with modern lithography, the, the spacing exactly, 60.00 gigahertz. And that's important because the rings are all fabricated in, in, in arrays with, with uh, known spacing, and, and uh, we need to hit that to get high-yield devices. So this shows the overall uh, process. So we have uh, 300 millimeter wafers fabricated at AIM that have all the arrays of modulators and polarization multiplexers and demultiplexers and detectors. Um, within one of these reticules, we have seven different designs for different architectures to achieve this. And then on each of these now, we bond the EIC to directly drive the, the modulators and detectors. 
Uh, so we get very low capacitance drive and very low capacitance detection. The energy per bit of these modulators is very low, about 8 femtojoules per bit, such that when you add in all of the rest of the elements, the electronics, the detectors, the lasers, we hope to achieve 100 femtojoules per bit at the end of the program, and presently we're about 500 femtojoules per bit. But this very efficient ring is, is really key to, to achieving this. I'd like to switch uh, topics a little bit here and talk about the progress in narrow line with lasers. So we tend to think of if you need a really quiet laser for some sensing system, using a fiber laser or gas laser, which has you know hertz level line widths. And as you go to smaller, cheaper sources, more integrated sources like semiconductor lasers, the line widths go up typically to a megahertz. And so they're very inefficient. They're very efficient uh, in cost and size, but very poor in terms of their performance and noise. So I'll, I'll talk about efforts to make heterogeneously integrated lasers and self-injection locked lasers. And these have much smaller line widths. And that's because the loss of silicon nitride waveguides is you know, 1,000, 10,000 times smaller than indium phosphide. So the low loss means we can get very high Qs, uh, 400 million and higher, um, and then consequently very narrow line width because the line width goes like 1 over the Q squared. And I think this is going to have a huge impact on sensors, on RF photonics, and precision navigation. So this shows the, the frequency noise out of a typical DFB laser. And uh, when we couple it, just hybrid uh, integrate, place them a, a adjacent to each other, such that the back reflection from this ring couples back into this DFB laser, we see a 70 dB reduction in the noise out of this laser. So this very high Q resonator eliminates all of the shallow towns noise. And uh, what's shown here are different resonators to different diameters. And as you make them longer, then uh, you get more reduction because they're fundamentally limited by thermal refractive noise. This is a collaboration we have with Kerry Bahala's group uh, at Caltech. And uh, all, most of the rest of the slides are in collaboration with his group. So this shows the progression of line widths over the last uh, 30 years. And you've seen a gradual reduction with uh, in the phosphide lasers over time, ultimately with quantum dot devices, because again, the zero line with enhancement factor gives smaller line widths. But now when you start looking at uh, heterogeneously or hybrid integrated devices with these low loss silicon nitride or silicon dioxide waveguides, we now see much, much smaller line widths. Intrinsic line widths now are down to just 40 millihertz, which is just a phenomenal result. And I think will revolutionize a lot of different sensor systems. The process of what's going on here, we, it's a tur turnkey uh, soliton generation or comb generation approach. And uh, Kerry O'Hala's group has been, been studying this in detail. And typically, with microresonators, it's difficult to get to the single soliton state. And uh, it takes you know, ramping the power and the, and the frequency in just the right way. This turnkey approach we have with this high uh, coupling between the resonator and the laser results when you turn the laser on, it just turn the current on. It, it goes immediately into the state. You don't need to do any tuning of either power or frequency, and it just comes on. And you can use this with small rings to generate terahertz combs uh, with, with up to you know, almost an octave of bandwidth or 20 gigahertz combs. And again, they're very quiet, and I'll talk some more about that application. But you can go down to sub-gigahertz. You can go up past, past a terahertz. So in the past, to generate these combs, took a lot of equipment and a lot of diagnostic equipment and is relatively complicated. Now we can put the entire system in just a small uh, butterfly package. And so all that's required is DC current. There's no uh, stabilization ne needed. The, the laser self-injection locks to the, the high Q resonator. So again, here's a picture of a 15 gigahertz. Here's one at a terahertz. Now most recently, in collaboration with Tobias Kippenberg's group at EPFL, we've been integrating these together on the same uh, pick. And so now we can make wafers of devices with literally, you know, thousands of integrated laser resonators. So you can see that here. It's blown up a little more here. So here's an array of lasers. And we've done this with DFB lasers, DBR lasers, uh, ring lasers, and then coupled to these passive uh, silicon nitride ring resonators. And again, a variety of frequencies, up to a terahertz and down to, to just uh, 20 gigahertz. And you can see one of those resonators here. So this is very exciting in terms of making it ubiquitous and, and low cost and, and applicable for, for a wide variety of sensors. 
We've used this technology. In fact, this technology was developed for the DODOS program, the Direct On-Chip Digital Optical Synthesizer. And this allows us to, to lock one of these widely tunable lasers that tunes across 50 nanometers, 20 terahertz, but we can lock it to just one hertz. And uh, we use this self-referenced optical spanning comb idea that was uh, revolutionized by uh, 20 years ago. So when you generate this comb of frequencies, and, and the repetition rate is, is well known, but you need to determine what the offset frequency is, F naught. And so if you double the red side of this and mix it with the octave uh, twice that frequency then and, and beat that, you can then determine F naught. If you know F naught and you know F repetition, then you can get any frequency you want uh, in between there. So we lock a tunable laser to one of these lines and, or any offset off that line using electronics, and uh, we can get uh, a known frequency by counting which line we're on and how much offset we are to within one hertz. So we know exactly the frequency we have within a hertz, and we can stabilize it to that. Now, a minor tweak is that these, what I've shown here, and in fact, here's an example of, of an octave comb over here. Uh, these are separated by a terahertz per comb line to get very low drive powers, but when you that's too high for electronics to stabilize. So we have to have a second comb at a much lower frequency. We lock the two combs together. So we can now take what used to be a very large system on an optical bench and put it in a small package. And in fact, the, side, what the package is determined by the electronics used to read out the signal and stabilize the signal. So the whole system is shown here. Here's an example. The pump laser drives the terahertz comb. It drives the 15 gigahertz comb. Uh, we have... Uh, Gallium arsenide is a highly nonlinear material that doubles the red light, the two micron light out of here uh, to get to mix with the, the one micron light. We measure that offset frequency with the detector and the rest of the electronics. And we use it to control this uh, tunable laser uh, here. And what you can see here is, is we can now step that frequency in steps of just, you know, subhertz uh, across literally, uh, you know, 20 terahertz of frequency. So here's an example of what's inside that package. So again, we have 15 gigahertz combs. We have uh, the tunable lasers I talked about. We have pump lasers. We have terahertz combs. And then an interposer made at NIST that uh, uh, connects all these hybrid devices together. So what are the applications of this? Uh, a big one is certainly microwave frequency synthesis, right? We can make very quiet oscillators, at, you know, Ten, many terahertz down to sub, sub gigahertz. And uh, here's one example of what I showed earlier. Uh, this using, putting a detector at the output of that comb gives us quite quiet operation. Not as good as what the Griffin program is aiming for. So minus 160 dB per hertz at just 10 kilohertz offset is, is a very challenging goal. And uh, it's going to really revolutionize a lot of systems. Obviously, having an optical synthesizer allows you to make a very coherent and secure communication systems with wavelengths uh, that can be adjusted over a wide range. You can use two of these combs together to make a very fast dual comb spectrometer uh, for chem biosensing. You can use these sources for atomic and quantum systems. So everything I've talked about has been primarily at 1300 or 1550, but there's a lot of work going on now with silicon nitride waveguides and again in the LUMOS program with gallium nitride gain regions uh, to uh, work uh, throughout the visible at, at a variety of sodium and strontium lines. And then finally, uh, LIDAR. So again, if you generate a comb of frequencies and disperse it with gratings, then you can get a two-dimensional two scanning field. And uh, you can also get range distance uh, by chirping the laser. And uh, so again, EPFL did a nice demonstration of LIDAR and analog photonics has as well. So what's next? Well, I think one really interesting area is the whole quantum area. And uh, we've been focusing this using gallium arsenide because gallium arsenide is highly nonlinear. It's, it's 100 times more nonlinear than silicon nitride, 1,000 times more nonlinear than uh, silicon dioxide. So we used it to double the light in, in dodos, but here we use it to entangle photons. So we get uh, mixing inside these resonators. And so what's plotted across here is, is the chi-3 nonlinearity, and you can see gallium arsenide is much more nonlinear than, than silicon or silicon nitride or, or lithium niobate. And consequently, the, the measured entangled rates we're getting are 200 times higher than anyone has seen before. 
So I think this will enable a wide variety of new applications, perhaps. Uh, so again, these are, are wafers of silicon nitride uh, or, or gallium arsenide uh, resonators. Uh, but we can use it for quantum gates, for boson sampling, for teleportation. And uh, so I, I think it's a really exciting new direction. So to summarize, I started off talking about the convergence of electronics and photonics. And that's what is driving the photonic integrated circuit field. Um, today we're at co-package systems, but we're moving towards 3D integration and, and then laser integration. And we're seeing I.O. capacities moving rapidly up to uh, 1,000 terabits per second. Uh, and, and commercially, following soon, soon behind that. Uh, uh, and we've seen real improvements in laser performance by m integrating on silicon. Noise has dropped by 70 dB by integrating with these silicon nitride waveguides. And I think that's going to have a lot of application for a variety of sensors or they're increasing the dynamic range of sensors or navigation, uh, integrated gyroscopes with these low-loss silicon nitride waveguides, RF photonics, uh, atomic clocks, and, and quantum computing. Thank you very much. Next up, DARPA MTO Program Manager, Dr. James Wilson, and Global Foundries Fellow, Dr. Alvin Joseph. Hi, my name is James Wilson, and I'm a Program Manager here at DARPA MTO. Today, I'm here to introduce the topic of advanced fabrication capabilities for mixed-mode microelectronics. Today's commercial and defense applications generally operate below 60 gigahertz, with bandwidths that go as high as 8 gigahertz. In the decadal plan that SRC published recently, it is reported that within the next 10 years, the demand for wireless data will drive the use of higher frequencies and wider bandwidths. For example, the 5G Release 17 is expected to expand the operating frequencies to include the range of 50 to 150 gigahertz, while it is speculated that 6G cellular could open up the 300 gigahertz to 3 terahertz range, both with commensurate increase in the bandwidth available. The ability to access higher frequencies and wider bandwidths is a function of the speed of the mixed-mode transistors that perform the precise analog and mixed-mode operations, such as analog-to-digital converters, frequency sources, and high-speed dividers. The speed of these mixed-mode devices are a fundamental limitation on the ability to improve performance and reach higher frequencies and wider bandwidths. One of the limits of today's 2D electronics is that transistor scaling is unable to increase the speed of the devices, as measured by the transistor cutoff frequency, called FT, and shown on the y-axis on the chart to the right. The right-hand curve shows CMOS process nodes from 130 nanometers down to 7 nanometers. FT was steadily increasing as the device is scaled from 130 until the 45 nanometer process node. The FT peaked at this node and has decreased steadily as the devices have shrunk. Silicon germanium bipolar devices achieve higher FT than their CMOS counterparts, but are only available on older legacy nodes, as shown on the left-hand side of the chart. These devices have FTs reaching 300 gigahertz, but the most advanced by CMOS process is on the 90 nanometer node, which limits the speed, memory size, and compute available to pair with the bipolar devices, as measured by the transistor density on the x-axis. Under the T-Music program, DARPA is seeking the development of SIGI bipolar devices on state-of-the-art CMOS nodes, pairing up the high compute power that dense integration provides with a high-speed bipolar device. This will enable wider bandwidth front ends, higher resolution data converters, and precision oscillators that can meet the demands of future 6G and DoD communication systems. During phase one of the T-Music program, Global Foundries has demonstrated silicon germanium bipolar devices integrated on the 45 nanometer process node that achieve 360 gigahertz FT and 525 gigahertz Fmax, easily surpassing the performance of the previous by CMOS process nodes, as shown by the blue square labeled phase one in the center of the chart. During phase two, T-Music is pushing to achieve 600 gigahertz FT and Fmax on the same 45 nanometer process node, as well as on a 22 nanometer process node shown by the blue square labeled phase two. 
it is expected that these speeds will allow for ADCs operating at 100 gigasamples per second with better than 8 effective number of bits, as well as 30 gigahertz PLLs operating with 20 dB lower phase noise, and dividers that can operate up to 200 gigahertz, all integrated in a high-yield, advanced CMOS node. Here to present the details of this mixed-mode device development is Dr. Alvin J. Joseph, fellow in the RF Technology Solutions Group at Global Foundries. Thank you, James, for the kind introduction. I'm quite delighted to be here today and talk about Global Foundry's development of an advanced 45 nanometer partially depleted high-performance silicon germanium by CMOS technology. With the collaboration of DARPA T-Music program, we are introducing an onshore high-performance silicon germanium by CMOS technology that helps address the next generation 60 sub-terahertz application. In the past decade, large investments were made in Europe to shore up high-performance silicon germanium by CMOS technology. As many of you will agree with me that it's very important to have high-performance silicon germanium by CMOS technology roadmap enabled for onshore access. We thank you. We thank YK for kickstarting the Team Music program and James Wilson for continuing it forward. For applications above 100 gigahertz, for example, 60 millimeter wave communication, sub terahertz sensing, and in radar systems, the lattice spacing for antenna elements are going to be sub one millimeter, and we require very low loss signal path from antenna to IC. These systems will require highly efficient front ends in a very small form factor. There are tremendous market opportunities if we can address this with a monolithically integrated high gain front end that also combines the horsepower of a high speed, high density digital CMOS. This will be the sweet spot for uh, silicon germanium by CMOS technologies. High-performance silicon germanium by CMOS is not new to the market. Industry has been using silicon germanium by CMOS for over three decades, starting with the 50 gigahertz FT transistors in a half micron CMOS node. More recent announcements from Europe, like IHP and ST Micro, have shown a standalone 500-700 gigahertz silicon germanium HBT transistor and a 300-500 gigahertz FTF max 90 nanometer by CMOS technologies. On the chart to the right, which plots the transistor peak FT and peak F max in gigahertz, we show that above 500 gigahertz F max will be the territory of HPTs, since CMOS will continue to struggle getting lower gate resistance and wiring parasitics beyond what was already achieved around 22 nanometer node. GF's 22 FDX fully depleted SOI shows about 420 gigahertz at max, and Intel's 22 nanometer FinFET technology showing about 460 gigahertz at max on this chart. If you walk up beyond that into the greater than 500 gigahertz at max regime, this is where silicon germanium HPT along with other compound semiconductor transistors reside. DARPA T Music has launched the onshore silicon germanium by CMOS roadmap with a 350-500 gigahertz NPN on a 45 nanometer CMOS with the goal to eventually move up to 600-700 gigahertz SIGI HPT on a 22 nanometer CMOS. Global Foundries is well positioned to drive this leadership 
high performance silicon germanium roadmap. We introduced a partially depleted SOI technology as our starting base CMOS technology on which a bipolar was formed. The picture on the right depicts a cartoon sketch such as a bi CMOS technology. This is world's first introduction of a 45 nanometer PDSOI called 45SD01 that is built in our state of the art 300 millimeter Malta fac fabricator. From a reference standpoint, a 300 millimeter bulk, 55 nanometer silicon germanium by CMOS is the most advanced node that has been demonstrated previously by ST Microelectronics. There are several advantages to this technology compared to traditional bulk based silicon germanium by CMOS. One, we can choose a high resistivity handle wafer and get better substrate noise performance without incurring pen penalty on a lateral spacing due to lateral probes. Two, lower transmission line loss and passive losses benefit from the use of high resistivity substrate. Three, partially depleted SOI CMOS devices have low junction capacitances thereby giving higher FTF max. Or silicon germanium HBTs can be isolated from other digital circuit with improved noise immunity. Left side of the graph shows silicon germanium FTF max versus collector current that we have achieved on 45 SG01. NPN performance greater than 350 gigahertz and F 500 gigahertz FMAC has been achieved while integrating with CMOS devices on the same substrate. The right hand side table shows the FTF max of the 45 PDSOI NFET in comparison to other bulk CMOS nodes. Here you can see 45 nanometer PDSOI as a far superior FTF max than that seen on a bulk 55 nanometer CMOS node. Looking forward, we plan to boost the NPN FTF max of this platform to 400, 600 gigahertz FTF max. Early work on the NPN has already shown results of 391 gigahertz and 527 gigahertz as shown on the top chart. We plan to continue with the PDK development and MPW offerings on this uh, technology. An initial 45 SG01 PDK with the 350-500 gigahertz NPN has been launched and an associated MPW is planned for 2022. In the near future, we look forward to seeing state-of-the-art circuit performance based on this technology introduction from other Team Music participants. Thank you very much. Please welcome Senior Fellow at Corvo, Dr. Charles Campbell. Welcome. My name is uh, Charles Campbell, and I'm a Senior Fellow with the Infrastructure and Defense Products Research Group at Corvo. The title of my talk is Hot Via and Copper Bumps for Three-Dimensional RF and Gallium Nitride and Gallium Arsenide MMICs. Our Corvo is a subcontractor to Northrop Grumman on the DARPA MIDAS program. And DARPA, uh, Northrop Grumman's approach to DARPA MIDAS required a level of three-dimensional integration that simply wasn't available at Corvo at program start. Shown here is what we were doing. So on the left here is, a, is typical of a commercial mobile handset module. You have unthinned die with copper pillars flip chip mounted onto a printed circuit board. Now this method is very inexpensive as there's no backside processing required on the die and it can be very, made very compact 
because the interconnect is through the copper pillars on the back side of the die. You don't need to leave space around the die for bond wires. However, the lack of a localized ground plane and a good thermal interface tends to limit this method to lower frequency, lower power applications. Now the other assembly technique is shown on the right. So we have thin die with a localized ground plane that are typically soldered to a thermally compatible metallic surface. So this assembly method is compatible with high frequency and high power operation. However, you still have to interface to the die, which is typically done with bond wires shown here circled in red. These bond wires do have inductance, and they do eventually limit the high frequency performance of components assembled this way. Therefore, this is better, but it still wasn't good enough for DARPA Midas. And more importantly, neither of these techniques is compatible with three-dimensional integration. So what we did is combine the best features of both approaches. We have a thin die with a localized ground plane. On the top surface, we have low inductance 90 micron tall copper bumps. This allows us to interface with circuitry above the die. On the back surface, the ground plane is selectively etched away to form these isolated regions, which can be connected to the top surface through substrate vias. This structure is called a hot via, and it allows the die to interface with circuitry below it. Finally, these copper bumps can be built directly on top of these substrate vias, such that the lower surface ground and the upper surface ground can be continuously connected together. This enables integrated RF shielding. Now this is the approach being utilized for DARPA Midas and also DARPA Warp to develop high isolation filter banks. Shown on the right here is the Northrop Grumman 3D stackup for DARPA Midas. The Corvo chip is in the middle and it interfaces with the SIGI digital beamformer below it through the hot vias. It also connects with the interface to the antenna feed above it through the copper pillars. So shown on this slide are some measure results for the power amplifier test breakout circuit for DARPA Midas. The actual PA chip is shown here and it's been flipped onto a gold plated copper molly carrier. The interface to this chip is through the back using the hot vias which you can see is these isolated regions here on the back of the mimic. Plotted on the right are measured results for this chip. The blue is small signal gain, and the uh, black trace is output match, which of course is important for a power amplifier. The dash traces are the simulated results. As you can see, there is very good measure versus model agreement with this particular design. Also, the part meets the minus metric shown in red for gain level and bandwidth. So to summarize, Developments on DARPA Midas at Corvo enable three-dimensional integration with integrated RF shielding and also a demonstrated high degree of modeling and simulation accuracy. Uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for attending. This begins the afternoon break. The closing keynote speaker and final remarks will commence at 3.45 p.m.